This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Haas's third Saturday seminar series. This morning, we are talking about first aid on the farm, and later in our session, we will be talking about plants toxic to horses. This is our first episode we're doing from the Haas farm, and with me is our first presenter, Dr. Ann McCombs. She knew she wanted to be a horse vet by the time she was 10 years old. She attended Iowa State University for her bachelor's, master's, and doctor of veterinary medicine, continuing her education from the University of Pennsylvania and the University of California, Davis. After working five years in private practice for Fox River Valley Equine Hospital, Dr. McCombs started her own practice in Harvard, Illinois, where she lives on a small farm with her family, several dogs, cats, chickens, horses, and mules. Dr. McCombs is a member of the American Veterinary Medical Association, the American Association of Equine Practitioners, the Illinois Equine Practitioners Association, the Unwanted Horse Coalition, and the Hub Club, where she drives her horses. We are lucky to have a vet with her experience and expertise for the horses here at Haas. Welcome, Dr. McCombs. Thank you. We will move to your slides. Here and get started. Well, good morning. This morning we're going to be talking about some equine emergencies. I've been a horse vet for almost 30 years, and I certainly have seen my share of uh, crazy emergencies. So there are some uh, behavior traits that do predispose horses to getting into bad situations. One is their instinctual flight response. They're uh, mostly flight animals and not so much fight animals. And uh, the other is their dominance hierarchy or their pecking order in a herd. So there's always gonna be some animals that uh, are picking on each other. Sorry, we're just getting this worked out. Um, horses have a natural curiosity about things and that can, curiosity killed the cat and the horse in some cases. And also they are gluttonous eaters. If they do break into the uh, feed room, they will eat a 50 pound bag of grain in no time flat. So it's up to us as their caregivers to try and avoid those situations um, by desensitizing them to spooky, scary things as best we can. Um, smart pairing when we do our turnouts, mares with mares or old horses with old horses and and uh, that sort of idea and then also to secure the feed room so that these horses if they do get loose they can't break in so most importantly when an equine emergency happens it's important that you keep calm um, horses feed off our energy, and so if we panic, it's going to make the situation quite a bit worse. So not everybody is well equipped emotionally to keep calm, but uh, if you have somebody who is panicking, remove them from the situation as best you can. Other people, animals, and objects can really be at risk when uh, a thousand-pound horse decides to panic and run. Uh, people safety always comes first. You need to control bystanders. They mean well, but may not have equine experience. And if a person gets hurt in trying to age you, that increases the liability and we don't want anyone to be hurt. It's nice if you can create an equine safe space for the treatment, meaning getting, getting them away from the uh, scary thing as best you can into maybe a, a stall or uh, fenced in area so that you can control that situation. And again, it's important that you have appropriate restraint for the horse. A, a halter and lead rope that fit correctly, or in some cases, if you don't have that, a rope that you can make into a temporary halter, but you need to be able to restrain the horse in case of an emergency. 
Um, it's wonderful. It would be ideal if you could have a disaster plan for natural disasters that occur in our area, such as floods, fires, and tornadoes. Not too many people I know do, but it's an ideal situation. And the American Association of Equine Practitioners has a website and has some good ideas for setting up that. So mostly um, our equine emergencies fall under a couple of headings, the cuts, the colics, and concerns. And it's important for us to recognize and respond to those emergency situations as quickly as possible in a calm manner. Um, you should know that in case of an emergency, everybody's got an opinion and they don't necessarily know they mean well, but um, use some common sense and safety first. When in doubt, call your vet and get the advice of somebody who is experienced with equine emergencies and comfortable with handling them. Don't wait. Um, horses really don't care about what time of the day it is. They love to do things in the middle of the night, holidays, vacations. I've had people say, oh, I didn't want to bother you. And uh, any delay could compl complicate your horse's uh, survival. So it's very important to be um, aware of basic equine body parts. And um, for purposes of this discussion, I'm not going to go through each body part. There's many, many, many um, references that you can go to uh, learn these different parts. But when you're calling your equine veterinarian and you're trying to describe where the injury is, uh, it's it's really helpful to be able to say this is the stifle, this is the hock, it happened on a fetlock, it's the knee, it's um, their pole. Um, so it's important for you to know the basic equine body parts. So when do you call the vet? And first and foremost, eyes are always emergencies. Um, they may not look like it, but a tiny defect in the cornea is extremely painful and can lead to blindness in a horse. Um, cuts need to be seen if there's excess bleeding, if it's a puncture wound, if it's a deep laceration where internal structures can be seen, um, if it's uh, over a joint or near a joint, if you can see that there's a foreign body present, um, or if there's severe contamination to that wound or if the horse is not able to bear weight on that leg. Um, horses can choke. Their choke is different from ours. If we're choking, uh, we are unable to breathe adequately. Horses are able to breathe, but it's a obstruction in their esophagus that's not moving on towards their stomach. And so they are unable to eat or drink at that point. Food might be coming out of their nose and or their mouth, and that is an emergency. A veterinarian would come out and um, pass a nasogastric tube to try and clear that obstruction. Colic is kind of an umbrella term. Um, colic can be caused by heart pain, lung pain, um, any kind of gastrointestinal pain, kidney, liver. Uh, so uh, any kind of body pain uh, can be called a colic and um, banamine is a kind of a brand name of a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication given to horses to help them relieve some of that pain um, horses might be thrashing uh, that's an emergency that's an indication of colic if horses haven't passed any manure after eight hours if their heart rate is above 60 uh, if if they have a fever of above 102, they may have a viral infection or some other kind of infection in their body. Um, if they're down and unwilling or unable to rise, that's an emergency or any abnormal condition or behavior that you recognize in your horse at that time. So midnight is not the time to make a relationship with a veterinarian that you've never met before. It's important to have a relationship with your veterinarian, one that you can trust and have your veterinarian know you, know your horse and have some history. Uh, it's important for that veterinarian to do a routine biannual exam to detect, treat and prevent some of these emergencies before they happen. 
have your vet's emergency number posted in handy in case you are not available, um, whoever your caregiver um, can be aware then. Uh, have that emergency contact information posted nearby where your horse is stable. Make sure that your vet has an emergency coverage if they are unavailable and how you are to reach the other veterinarian when your vet's not available. Um, have a plan if your horse needs to be transported. If you don't have your own truck and trailer, you need to know somebody who does or there are commercially available trucks and trailers that will move your horse for you. But have those phone numbers available and know how to reach them. Know who you can count on in an emergency, somebody who's good with horses, someone who's level-headed and will be a help, not a hindrance. Um, if you need to be gone for any reason, leave written authorization in your absence if you can't be reached. I once had a horse that had been um, taken to a stable and the owner was out of town. The horse was brand new to the stable. The horse colic very, very badly and uh, needed to be euthanized and the owner couldn't be contacted. Um, we alerted the police to go knock on their door, the home of the place. They had the wrong address. Everything was just a mess. We ended up putting the horse down because it was in such pain and the owner was reached the following day. So it was uncomfortable for everyone. So try to avoid that situation. Um, you should know that most first responders like police and firemen are not trained or equipped to handle equines. So if you call 911, um, though they <laughs> want to be supportive, uh, they're not going to be able to help you with your equine emergencies in most cases. So in order to save time when every moment counts, uh, your vet's going to ask some questions to assess the situation and direct your first aid efforts until they can get there to help you. Uh, pictures and texts uh, are worth a thousand words and are a lot of times fairly helpful. They're not three-dimensional, so it's difficult to tell the depth of a wound, uh, but it's, it's worthy of trying to get some good pictures. Use a flash so you have plenty of good light. Um, and that's very helpful. Uh, your valuable observations and measurements need to be ready. And we're gonna talk about some equine normals and what those measurements might be. It's a good idea not to administer any medication or treatment unless your vet directs you to do so. Be prepared for the veterinarian to ask you about history of any feed changes, deworming recently, vaccinations given recently, is your horse pregnant, uh, recent travel that the horse has uh, been on, um, or other horse illnesses in your stable nearby. Subjective observations are based on your opinion and your knowledge of your horse's normal. Um, that might be their attitude. What's normal for your horse is not normal for another one. Um, their appetite, energy level, are they bright? Are they dull? Are they depressed? Are they withdrawn? Uh, the herd dynamic is your horse is the alpha and always first to the gate and your horse is uh, isolating itself and by pulling back. That's a difference and you need to bring that to the veterinarian's attention. Um, is your horse eating? Has your horse been drinking, urinating, defecating normally? Uh, are they sweating, shivering, coughing, breathing too fast? Uh, breathing too slow? Um, are they standing differently, moving strangely? Um, are, are there tears coming out of their face, squinting, any weird swelling, um, bleeding, biting at their sides, kicking at their belly? Um, objective measurements are things that you can actually measure, temperature, pulse, respiration. So some equine normals are listed. Um, a horse's normal temperature, it, it varies somewhat with the environmental temperature, but between 98 and 101 with a rectal thermometer. Make sure you have a working. It's a, you can use a regular human digital thermometer that you can get at any drugstore um, and have one handy. A horse's pulse should be between 30 and 40 beats per minute in most cases. A stethoscope is really handy to have, makes it a lot easier, but you can take their pulse behind their elbow when you feel um, their heartbeat or 
under their jaw because there's a major vessel there that you can feel. Um, the respiration should be between six and 20 breaths per minute. Uh, you can watch their flank go in and out or their nostrils go in and out. Uh, digital pulses are taken at the front fetlock joint just to the inside and outside of that. If you lightly uh, hold your thumb and your forefinger there, but it takes a little bit of practice. Um, it's helpful to do it when the horse is normal and not trying to uh, go down or kick at you. Uh, gut sounds, we auscultate uh, with a stethoscope, but you can also use your ear. Um, we listen in four different areas, um, high and low, on each side of the horse's flanks. And you should hear growling and bubbling and burbling and pinging. Um, that, that's normal. Again, if you, if you do it when your horse is healthy, then you'll know if it's abnormal. Their gum color, if you lift up their upper lip, should be a nice light pink color. Any other colors are abnormal. Uh, hydration, the gum should be slippery wet, not uh, sticky. Uh, a skin pinch of the upper eyelid is another way to estimate their hydration. And it should snap right back when you pinch it up. Uh, capillary refill time is when you pick up their upper lip and you press your finger on their gums to blanch a spot on the gums. Remove your finger, count 1001, 1002, 1003. That's about normal. If it's prolonged, then it indicates that there's a cardiovascular problem. So anything outside of that would be considered an equine abnormal. So horses posture, if they're parking out, stretching, if they're biting at their sides, laying down, they could be kicking, rolling, um, if they haven't cleaned up their breakfast when they're normally big time eaters, if their manure is not as um, prevalent as normal. Everybody should have an idea, should there be two piles, should there be three piles, within reason. Um, should there be one piece spot, two piece spots, be aware or make sure that your barn uh, and stable help are watching that and not just cleaning up those stalls and not paying attention. In addition, is the manure cow pie? Is it liquid? Is it a uh, little ball bearings? Um, those are really important things to know as you clean up the stall or paddock or where your horse lives. Uh, neurologic signs, head pressing, staggering, muscle twitching, they can be tripping, falling and slobbering, um, exaggerated gaits, and in some cases they act blind. Um, clearly those are abnormal conditions. If they're shifting their weight, taking the weight off one foot, pointing one foot, um, that's an indicator that they have some lameness, some pain going on. Um, if they rock back over their haunches, um, they're trying to get the weight off their front feet, that's an indication that they're having uh, problems, perhaps laminitis is on the way. Um, if a horse gets cast, and that means they're too tight up against a stall wall, barn wall, or fence, uh, and most horses, if they're normal and healthy, will not get themselves in that situation. Um, so if they get cast, that means maybe they were not paying attention to where they lay down. Um, maybe they were painful and they were just thrashing about. Uh, we talked a little bit about the choking, that it's an obstruction in their esophagus and they can't swallow. Um, they can have strange mouth movements. Um, I had a horse just recently that uh, abnormally started to bite the bars of his stall and when we took a look inside with a mouth speculum and a headlight, there was a broken tooth in there that was sideways and pushing into the, the uh, cheek. So he was just doing the best he could to try to relieve that pain. Um, if your horse is quieter than normal, louder than normal, spookier than usual, um, refluxing horses, normal horses cannot vomit. Um, but if they spontaneously have food materials um, pouring out their nose or their mouth, um, that means that there's an obstruction lower down in their gastrointestinal tract and everything is back flowing out. And it's a really, really bad sign. If they've developed diarrhea, any kind of significant bleeding, uh, abnormal discharges, swelling, heat, pain, lumps, the list goes on and on as, as far as abnormals, but it's important that you recognize your horse is normal so that you can tell what is abnormal. So be prepared by having a fully stocked, well-organized, 
uh, available, not uh, lent out or frozen in the horse trailer. Uh, make sure that the items inside are not expired or someone borrowed them and didn't return them uh, and have the knowledge to know how and when to use the contents. So in many cases, um, barn owners and our managers maintain a first aid kit uh, and that's available for use on all the borders horses. Find out ahead of time uh, before you have an emergency, how you access that, uh, who's responsible for making sure the things are available and not uh, expired and uh, make sure that uh, if the trainer has gone to a horse show that they don't take that one with them and leave you without any uh, emergency first aid kit. Um, a lot of people go in and share because it's an economical way to have these medications available, um, but just make sure that um, they're not uh, being moved around and um, taken to horse shows in a way when you might need it. So if you intend to create your own first aid kit, which is a pretty good idea, uh, you need a container that's large enough to fit everything in there with some organization. It doesn't look like you just threw it in because um, when every second counts, you don't want to be searching, especially it may be in dim light and or you send someone else to go grab something from your kit and they don't know where anything is. Uh, it should be water, dust and rodent protected and uh, it should be light enough that you can take it wherever you and your horse go. Uh, lovely idea is on the inside cover is to have emergency information, um, your veterinarian's name, perhaps the name of somebody who could trailer your horse or multiple um, who are capable of helping you in, in an emergency situation. Uh, also, a great idea is to have information for some of those medications that you're not really familiar with using, a content card so that you can kind of check it off. Uh, if I do a spring reorganizing of my own first aid kit to make sure that things are not expired, have not been uh, used up and not, not replaced. Um, and each kit can be customized for your own needs. So I have a list of off the shelf things that you may want to put in your first aid kit. Uh, the betadine scrub for cleaning wounds. Um, DMSO is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory that can be topically applied to swelling, itching, um, anything that's inflammatory. Great to have some non-sterile latex gloves to keep your hands clean and um, not make a wound dirtier. Um, drying salve, ichthamol, we use that uh, in case a horse has a splinter or an abscess, bruise. Um, plain old neosporin ointment, the triple antibiotic that you can buy for yourself is also great for horses. Uh, chlorhexidine, also known as Novasan, is another um, anti-infective uh, anti cleansing solution. Uh, leg cottons, um, the brand name is BB Satin Star, are very helpful. Uh, large nonstick gauze pads, vet wraps, which come in multiple different um, sizes and under different names. They're an elastic wrap on bandage. Hoof knife, uh, hoof pick, uh, shoe pullers, potentially a boot that you can put on if your horse loses its shoe or, or needs protective covering for its foot. Um, an instant ice pack that you just shake and uh, it gets nice and cold is great to have in there. Some Epsom salts with a soak pan in case your horse has a puncture wound or, or an abscess or bruise that forms. Some kind of clipper or shaver to clean an area if you have a laceration that you need to keep cleaned up. Some saline wound wash spray is available at any uh, drug store that's really handy to clean a wound. Some saline eye wash, also available at your local drugstore. Um, SWAT is uh, wonderful because it's um, uh, antibiotic type, but it also has uh, a fly repellent in it. Uh, some sort of a light source. 
some clean gauze. Great to have some scissors, keep them nice and sharp. Um, roll cotton, duct tape. Who doesn't need duct tape? That helps um, multiple things. Some people band-aids, because we ourselves can get hurt. Uh, leg wraps, plastic wrap, uh, a multi-tool which has pliers and a knife and um, super, super handy. Vaseline poultice, which can be used for uh, if you've got an insect sting or you uh, have a, a leg injury with swelling uh, or even an abscess. Uh, towels to keep everything clean and dry. Again, the thermometer, make sure that you have one and that it's working. Just a regular human digital thermometer is fine. You don't have to have a, a specific equine one. Uh, a stethoscope is great to have. A wire cutter, zinc oxide for soothing skin, sunburn, bug bites. Type of electrolyte, they come in paste and powders. Alcohol, hydrox, uh, hydrogen peroxide. A notepad, pen, in case you call your veterinarian and they're giving you uh, directions and or dosages, it's nice to write it down in the heat of the moment, you might forget. So some items are not available over the counter and those must be obtained from your veterinarian. If you have a good relationship with your veterinarian, uh, you can discuss your needs and the, your veterinarian can uh, provide and demonstrate how to use certain of these products and give you an appropriate dosing schedule for use in your particular horse. Um, those items might be a steroid like dexamethasone. Uh, and some of those are, dexamethasone can come as an oral powder. It can also be as an injectable and you can squirt that in a horse's mouth. So you don't have to be comfortable giving a shot uh, in order to have this in your first aid kit and be able to administer it in an emergency. Uh, Banamine, again, is a brand name. Flunixin, Meglamine is the uh, product name. Uh, that comes also as an injectable or a paste that can be given orally. Ace Promazine is a sedative to take the edge off a horse that's um, anxious or lower their blood pressure in case of laminitis. And that comes as tablets or injectable, which also can be injected in to their mouth, so you don't have to give a shot. Uh, Bute, which is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication, which comes in multiple different forms. Silver, Silver sulfadiazine ointment is a wound ointment antibiotic, very useful for uh, deep wounds and or burns. Dormosidan gel type of, uh, needs to be combed whatever the emergency might be. Uh, Elasticon is an extra sticky uh, supportive wrap, combine dressing. Uh, and antihistamine can be useful. I was camping one time and the bugs were eating my horse alive and he became extremely itchy and sensitive. And so I was happy that I had some antihistamine powder and could administer that orally. Uh, you, if you do get the injectable, you are going to need the appropriate size needles and syringes to administer. Even if you draw it up with a needle and syringe and then squirt it into their mouth, you still need to be able to draw it up. And uh, some sort of a eye antibiotic ointment in case of an eye injury. So uh, you need to have your options open. You need to prepare in advance for trailering, um, maintain your own towing vehicle and trailer in good working order. I had a situation at one time where the horse had an emergency colic, needed to go to a referral hospital for surgery and waited for 45 minutes for the people to say that the trailer was ready to go. And when I went out there, the individual was in the, in the dark, um, tossing items out of a box looking for the trailer hitch. Uh, so I ended up going and getting my own truck and trailer and moving the horse. And it, it was just a delay that was not necessary. And the horse ended up not making it because of the delay. Um, make sure your trailer is accessible. In this, uh, certainly this spring with everything mud, uh, maybe your trailer is parked in a place that is too muddy to get your trailer uh, your truck backed up to it or maybe over the winter you know everything's been uh, tossed around it um, so 
keep a trailer available, keep a, a towing vehicle in, in good working order. Um, hopefully you've got fuel and uh, you can load up. Um, know in advance uh, the referral options, the hospitals that your veterinarian might want you to go to and have an idea how to get there. Um, might need the map, might need the GPS. Um, an address to to figure that out. In the middle of the night, and when moments count, it's best not to have to figure those things out. And then you need to have a calm and capable driver. Again, with that, you know, not everybody's equipped to be level-headed in, in, in emergency situation. And the last thing you need to do is have a trailer accident on the way to the referral hospital. Or you quietly in a trailer. So many people have horses. lots and lots of options. Trainer or look on the uh, YouTube video on how to train your horse to get on a trailer. Uh, that's vitally important when moments count. So, going to talk a little bit about bandaging. And so, bandages are a wonderful and terrible thing. If they are applied wrong, they can cause more damage than they help with. But, but uh, a bandage that is applied correctly Uh, uh, affected area and we want to make sure that if it's a bleeding wound that you would uh, cover that actual wound with a non-stick telfa. Uh, you want to know that uh, if you're bandaging over a joint you have to use elastic so it gives when they bend um, the bandage should be snug but not too tight um, you should apply it with even pressure you can wrap in either direction that's an old wives tale that you can only wrap in one direction if you're wrapping over a swollen leg you need to wrap with a bandage that yields as the as the swelling goes down um, or the, if the swelling goes up um, that it doesn't constrict and cause additional damage. Bandages need to be changed every three to four days unless there's a lot of drainage or if the horse uh, lays in manure and or urine or gets it soiled with mud. Um, and anytime oh, you've got a horse bandaged and the horse becomes more lame or develops a fever or becomes swollen above the bandage, you need to remove it and take a look and see what's under there. Um, we're going to uh, take a break from the slides for one second and we're going to do uh, a bandaging demonstration real quick. So this tube represents the horse's leg and I've selected, this is, a, it's called a Nobo uh, quilt. Uh, it's good because you can't really get it too tight and, and hurt the horse. So uh, assuming this is the horse's leg you would start I like to say we'll wrap and then the nice and even and smooth as you unwrap it again this one this no bow is a good choice because it doesn't matter what you try hold too tight top of a quilt you would be putting a standing bandage um, there's two kinds there's the standing bandage this one's more of a kind of a nylon feel to it um, and then they have these that are like uh, polar fleece. And these are not to be used over the top of a, a standing or a, a quilt. These are to be put on a bare horse. This is a standing bandage. Generally, 
I start in the middle, a nice even wrap. Up, overlap just a little bit, it's an even and overlap as you go. And hopefully if you've wrapped your bandage right, you end up with the Velcro correctly and you can velcro that right off so it should thump like a ripe melon when you've done it correctly uh, sometimes horses are uh, problematic and they'll grab at the bandage you can take a piece of uh, masking tape or duct tape and go over the velcro to hold it in place sometimes horses will pluck at it and they tighten it abnormally uh, and those horses need to have uh, they make products um, no chew um, they make uh, a bandage uh, that goes over the top it's called a porcupine and it's got little nubies that uh, kind of annoy the horse's mouth if they try to pluck at the bandage um so uh a horse is like you can go to the next slide okay so sooner or later if you have horses long enough you're going to have a laceration uh, so for profusely bleeding wounds, you're going to need to apply direct pressure. You can use a clean towel, a sanitary napkin, a diaper, um, any kind of bandage. Plan on holding pressure on it for at least 30 minutes to stench the flow of blood. Unless a wound is really, really dirty, don't use a hose or tap water. Um, as we know, tap water has bacteria, it has all sorts of minerals in there, and that can contaminate the wound. Uh, it's a kind of a rule of thumb that you wouldn't put anything in a wound that you wouldn't put in your own eye. Um, don't use alcohol. I've had some people put alcohol on there thinking they're gonna disinfect. Well, that hurts like blue blazes. You wouldn't put that in your eye. Um, I have very little use for hydrogen peroxide, except perhaps maybe for puncture wounds or for getting blood off a gray horse. Otherwise, I don't use hydrogen peroxide very much because it's very caustic and it will kill tissue, healthy and dead tissue. Um, so uh, I, I don't have a lot of use for that. You can use a 0.5% bleach solution that you make up, make sure it's that weak. Um, if there's a lot of necrotic or dead tissue to be <coughs> removed in a, in a wound, uh, uh, the betadine and or nolvasan solution that we talked about before, uh, antiseptic solutions should be used diluted only because in full strength they, they will actually kill and injure healthy tissue. So I say uh, the betadine solution should be like a weak iced tea color and the Novasan solution should be like a baby blue uh, color when you clean a wound. You can purchase saline from a, a drugstore or You can make your own saline if you use one liter of boiled water with <coughs> two teaspoons of salt in it and mix it up. That makes a readily available source of saline that you can flush the wound out with. Uh, so foreign bodies. If, if you come in, you see your horse holding a foot up and you pick the foot up and find that there's a, a nail or a uh some sort of a piece of wood or something projecting in the foot your first instinct is oh grab it out remove it immediately um try not to remove it because uh, your veterinarian 
will want to see where it went in and as soon as you pull it out that hole kind of sinks sucks up and you can't find it very easily again um, and also to know the depth and the direction of that uh, nail so that uh, uh, we might take a radiograph of that um, if you have to pull it out um, carefully observe to see what direction it went into and mark on the nail the depth that it has gone in nail or screw or whatever uh, if you remove it it may make the bleeding worse uh, so uh, if you can I'm going to show you uh, a quick and easy method to stable the wound until your vet can get there and take the radiograph and then remove it. I have a sample hoof right here and I've placed a nail like it might go in if the horse had stepped on it. I don't know if you can see that accurately. So the first thing you do is you see this horse is holding this foot off the ground going ow, ow, ow. And instead of instinctively wanting to pull it right out, if you take anything, I, I have a block of wood. You can put the block of wood on underneath this horse's foot and you can duct tape it or take a polo wrap and wrap it around that horse's foot. So he's stepping not on the nail driving it further in, but he's stepping um, on the board. You can use anything that's on that nail and driving it further into his hoof. He gets there and can assess of that nail. Sir. Uh, newborn rule that nurse and the mare should pass their birth within three hours. The foal also should pass meconium, which is the first fecal matter that they pass um, during that three hour period of time. Um, danger signs include the foal is depressed, it's not interacting with its mom, uh, maybe it walks over to the wall and is head pressing. Um, anytime a, a baby's uh, temperature is above 102, increased respiratory rate. Um, straining to defecate or if they have diarrhea, um, if they are jaundiced or icteric, uh, that means that their liver is involved, they'll be kind of an orange colored mucous membranes or any kind they have any swelling or painful joints. Or or umbilicus. Those are all emergencies and, and you should notify your veterinarian. Laminitis and lamina. Um, some people call it intermittent. I'm going to go back one slide. There we go. Uh, so laminitis, inflamed lamina um, can progress to the rotation of their coffin bone within In their hoof caps. So, or the sinking of their skeletal frame within that hoof capsule and out the bottom of their foot. Um, it's an extremely painful condition. Uh, laminitis can be brought on by many, many different uh, reasons. Uh, it be Cushing's disease. Uh, they'll develop uh, laminitis secondary to that uh, through sepsis. Uh, it is an absolute veterinary emergency. Uh, kind of the classic
you see the picture, the horse is rocked back over his haunches and his uh, front two legs are stiff and kind of out in front of them. They are seeking to remove pressure from those feet. And he can, some horses lay down and don't. In some cases, their feet will feel hot, but in almost every case, their digital pulses. Again, we talked about that, that you feel that at their fetlock with your thumb and forefinger on either side of their fetlock. Uh, feel their normals, know their normals. And uh, when they're having laminitis, uh, their pulses are what we call bounding. They're very strong. Um, first aid for this is to administer bute, phenylbutazone to your horse. Uh, immerse their feet in water with ice floating in it, not just cold water, but water with ice floating. And support their frogs with uh, their frog supports. There's boots with frog supports. And... Um, uh, and, uh, establishes what other treatment is necessary. Do that until your veterinarian comes and I just want to make sure we're still recording this. <clears throat> okay. We're just making sure that we're actually sharing the slides that we're supposed to be seeing. Okay. okay, as you remember, earlier in the talk, I said eyes are always emergencies and uh, lacerations to eyelids are very common. Um, I call them eyelid noodles. Uh, they'll catch it on something and then they feel the pain and they rip and those eyelids just dangle. Uh, they do require evaluation and sutures. Um, the eye globe itself can be scratched, it can be poked, it can develop an ulcer. Um, they can have an itch and they rub it against something and, and abrade it. Um, so, uh, a painful eye has can undergo some internal structure changes that can lead to blindness. And so that is why eyes are always considered to be emergencies. The eyeball itself can enlarge in the case of like glaucoma, but in many cases uh, it shows swelling or edema by turning a bluish cloudy color like the, the photo shows. Um, but anytime the horse is blinking excessively, tearing, or any kind of discharge, um, whether it's pussy looking or mucus looking, um, eyelid swelling, um, eyes closed, or any kind of corneal. Color changes, um, you need to call your veterinarian right away. Um, they need to have appropriate medication. Um, your veterinarian will likely stain the eye surface. And uh, just remember that when in doubt, call a vet for eye emergencies. We talked about colic before. Um, generally, that can be any kind of visceral pain. Horses can appear colicky if they have heart problems, if they have lung problems, kidney, liver. Or um, gastrointestinal. Um, be very careful with these horses. They're very painful. They're bad. And they don't know that they're pretty so assess the situation with your veterinarian as quickly as possible because moments do count in um, re resolving it, uh, potentially getting them off to a referral hospital for medical or surgical intervention. Uh, if you can take vital signs uh, carefully, uh, do so to share with your veterinarian. If the horse is lying quietly, leave them alone. Don't move them. It's okay that they lay. Uh, 
if the horse is thrashing, they're more at risk from thrashing, not so much the twisting of an intestine because they're thrashing, but because they're not paying attention to their surroundings, they can get cast up against a fence or a wall, they can bang their head and or their, their legs and, and get injured that way. So if you can get them into a large open space in arena or outside where they're not gonna crash into something and further injure themselves, again, um, people's safety comes first in that case. Um, I have had people that have walked their horses for hours. The horses are exhausted, the people are exhausted, and really the horse is still colicking. Um, so you've just kind of aggravated the situation. Um, so that is not advisable nor necessary. Don't give them any food if they're colicking. It won't kill them, they can miss a meal. They need to uh, pass whatever's going on with the colic and then they can catch up with their food. Um, if you're able to, um, listen for gas with a stethoscope or your ear um, right there at their flank region. Um, and don't administer any medication unless you're directed to do so by your veterinarian. So reminding you, safety is always uh, your first consideration um, for humans and horses and other livestock that are nearby. Um, there's a great schematic here about the line of fire um, with the area around their head and neck being for experienced handlers only because those necks and heads can come up off the ground in a heartbeat and smash into you. Um, the working zone is over their back and rump and the danger zone that no one should be by is anywhere near those legs. They can, those front legs can come up and kick their chins and those back legs can come up and be almost level with their back. So um, stay in a safe zone when you're working on a downed horse, remain calm, ask for qualified calm help. You need to think before you jump in and do something. Um, I had a situation one time where uh, there was a horse who backed off of a cliff and fell down a steep embankment into the creek below and his back was in the creek and his legs were up in the air and he was kind of wedged there. And a couple of ladies luckily were nearby and they got into the creek and held his head above the water so he didn't drown. And there were many, many, many well-meaning people who wanted to just throw a rope around his neck and haul him out of the creek by his neck and a rope and a tractor, which would have probably broken his neck because he was kind of wedged in the creek bed. Um, the other thing was that um, the Forest Service had cut off a bunch of sapling trees that were in the embankment and they were sharp, about two inch tall um, <laughs> sticks and they were gonna drag that horse up and over those two inch sticks, um, which would have punctured and uh, cut him. So um, calmer minds did prevail. We were able to get some rubber mats from a local stable. We put the rubber mats over the top of the sticks and we were able to have some nice wide toe straps put on him. And we were able to direct a tractor driver to slowly pull him out of the creek bed and up onto the bank um, where I treated him and he successfully recovered and uh, walked to a stall and was was safe. So, you know, everybody wanted to do something quickly and they meant well, but it could have hurt the horse or killed the horse or hurt a human in doing so. Here's a couple of uh, different uh, pictures of safe ways to move a horse. On the far left, the uh, you can use fire hose, you, you can use toe straps. Um, the strap goes between the two front legs, behind the elbow and up and over the withers and comes back down and ducks in underneath the opposite. Uh, 
that is called a, a forward toe and that puts the pressure over their over their withers and behind their front legs and not on their head or their neck or their legs. Never tow a horse by their tail or their leg extremities or their head or their throat latch. Um, the center view is if your horse should be down, um, horses physically crush themselves with their body weight if they lay for prolonged periods of time. And so uh, it's sometimes helpful to flip them over uh, that puts the, the good circulation muscles um, on the top and sometimes that allows them to be able to get up. So if you'll notice, there's a halter and a lead rope and a person that's been assigned to watch the horse's head and keep the head safe. You'll notice she's not really close, but she's got a long rope so she can direct and save that horse's head from crashing into things. And then the toe strap goes across the chest underneath the horse's chest, uh, behind both forelimbs along the ground, and then comes up um, behind the horse's rear legs. And so you're using the horse's core to flip them over as opposed to their legs. And then the picture on the far right uh, is a sideward draw, drag, and you can put the toe strap underneath the horse's chest um, they make like shepherd's crooks or canes that you can physically push the strap underneath their bodies. Um, and then the, the second strap is underneath the horse's hip, comes out by their groin and uh, uh, comes up uh, by their tail back to the person. And that would allow a safe sidewards pull if that horse was cast in a fence or something and the legs were under the fence and you needed to pull it side. That's using the horse's body. So the take home message for this is, uh, if you have horses long enough, you will be involved in horse emergencies, whether it's your own horse or whether it's a friend's horse or someone at the barn. Um, stay calm, be safe, control the situation, always accept help from people who have some education about doing that, be prepared with a good first aid kit, and practice and know your horse's normals before you need to in an emergent situation. So thank you very much, and I can open it up to some questions. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. McCombs? We will check the chat. Thank you, Karen. We did catch that. Um, so please feel free to unmute yourselves and ask Dr. McCombs some questions. Anything? Um, there's one uh, thing that I noted, and I've always kind of heard that you should have a string on the thermometer any thermometer that you're using for horses. Can you talk a little bit about maybe how, how to take a horse's temperature? Well, in years gone by, we had mercury thermometers and they made large animal thermometers and they had an eye on the end of it. And those thermometers lent themselves very well to tying a string on there that you could put a clip and you could clip it to the horse's tail while you went off and, and you know listen to the horse's heart or hydration or something like that. Um, in more present times, we don't have those mercury thermometers anymore and we use just a human digital thermometer available at any drugstore. So you actually have to stand there and hold it. Um, if you don't hold it, it is possible for the horse to suck that thermometer into their, their rectum and Usually they'll come back out again with the next uh, manure passing, but it's safer just to stand and hold it. Wonderful. And then when you were talking about turning a horse over um, when it had been cast, I had that experience as well. I was horse sitting for a very dear friend of mine, and this was her very older mayor. And I came out in the morning and she was cast up against a fence. Um, 
And so uh, I called a very course knowledgeable friend and she suggested two lead ropes around the Fetlock area. And to me, um, you always hear about how delicate their legs are and how fragile and to be careful. And it just didn't sound right. Um, so you would recommend using the core. So up under the elbow. Yeah. And, the and also lead ropes are typically not going to be long enough to get you out of the business end of the horse when they're flipping. Cause again, you're going to be close to their back and you flip them over. The legs are going to be facing you. There's no way around that. So better to use a lunge line or okay. an, have a long rope available for for those situations and yes try to avoid using their extremities down by their feet um you can injure a horse uh, by attaching a rope or anything to their head neck feet or, or tail try to use the core whenever possible yes we um in tech technical large animal emergency rescue which is how we train first responders to deal with this we like to say that um, appendages are not of course is that is that fair yeah that's advice fair. To but there are situations where you, know, you can't get to uh an ideal torso pull mm -hmm. uh, but you you risk injuring the horse significantly just like you would risk injuring a human if in a car accident and you and you put traction on their head and neck um, if they've got an underlying in injury, you could you know, potentially paralyze them. And in a horse, you could you could dislocate their their neck or or cause significant injury. So try as best you can to uh, drag them with their core. Wonderful. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. McCombs? We do have one in the chat. I've always wondered when taking a rectal temperature. Do you have the thermometer in mid-air, quote unquote, or position it next to a wall, top or side, and get different, and Karen has gotten different answers when she asks. So we'll see what Dr. McCombs has to say. I think you're gonna get a more accurate temperature if you're gonna be near a, uh, the wall of the intestine, uh, the colon. So, uh, I would go with the wall if at all possible. Sometimes your horse has a big load of poop in there and you uh, directly put your thermometer in there in the mid air and you're not gonna get an accurate temperature because they're gonna get poop temperature, so. Are there any other questions? The only question I have, I've got very poor internet here today and it's kind of been going in and out. So I'm just wondering how soon we'd be able to get a copy of this. I want to go back and <laughs> that was very, very informative. Thank you very much. But there are some points that I want to go back and review. And I think some of the previous ones Jenna had put on a YouTube link or something. So I don't know if she could answer that. I will have to find the answer to that. Okay. <laughs> Hang on a second. When will this be available? Uh, it's usually within a week or two. Uh, within a week or two, it will be up and available. Excellent. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, I think that's it. Wonderful. 
Thank you so much. We're just getting Dr. Klein to join us. So he should be with us momentarily. Dr. McCombs, thank you so very much You're for joining welcome. us this morning and giving us such a wonderful, and the demonstrations were fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. So we will take just a brief moment. And if everyone wants to refill their coffee and perhaps take a bio break, we'll be back in just a second. Thank you. Now we see you. Okay, so um, to get my, okay, I just hit share, right? Oh, it says to share, ask the organizer to make you presenter. All right. Okay, I am going to introduce you real quickly, and then we will get started. Okay. okay. Bye-bye. All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. We have with us now Dr. Kevin Klein, who has been a professor of animal sciences at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign for almost 40 years, and also serves as the state extension specialist for both youth and adults. Dr. Klein serves as a director of the Horseman's Council of Illinois, and has been the chair of the Illinois Equine Foundation that raises scholarship funds on behalf of Horseman's Council. He is also a consultant for several state racing commissions and racetracks regarding the integrity of horse racing and conducts research on the detection and deterrence of illegal substances in racehorses. Dr. Klein is personally active in horse judging, standard bred breeding, and harness racing. We're so glad he can join us this morning. Welcome, Dr. Klein. Thank you, Jen. I appreciate it. Now, it may take me a few minutes to try to figure out how to get my slides linked up here. So um, let's see. What's the what's the next step? Okay. Do I click on share screen? I believe share screen will do it. Okay. Let's see. Okay, do I click make presenter or do I just go from here? Let's see, what's this? Okay, there's my screen. So what I want is... And we can see you. Or we can see your screen. <laughs> okay. All right, but that's not the one I want to share. So I need to... Okay, let's try this one. Okay, there we go. That's the one I want. Oh, that looks uh, favorable. Okay. And full screen. Do the How's that look? We should be seeing it momentarily. 
you might need to click on the PowerPoint um, icon at the bottom of your screen. Okay, so let me see here. All right, where am I, where am I finding this, this PowerPoint icon? So you're not seeing my uh, my PowerPoint slides at this point. There we go. Oh, it came up all of a sudden. I didn't do anything. It just we are. <laughs> takes a while, huh? Okay. You know, all I'm right. sure the internet gets tired every once in a while as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, um, this uh, presentation is probably not exactly in my wheelhouse in terms of uh, my uh, expertise, but uh, this is something that I put together a few years ago just to sort of, uh, you know, do the lecture circuit like we're doing now. There are a lot of people interested um, and or have been affected by toxic plants. And um, it's uh, it's something that, um, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, remembering which ones are toxic, it's almost impossible. But, but you know, you should in general sort of assume that anything that's not a crop pasture grass uh, or or legume is is probably and or possibly toxic at, at least some point in time and, and a lot of these uh, toxins in plants um, are you know seasonal in nature and so they become more or less toxic uh, you know according to the state of the plant I'll just tell I'll tell you a quick story that uh, kind of goes along with this concept you know way back uh, uh when when uh general custer was and his uh, his troops were were routed at the battle of little bighorn um uh part of the reason possibly that they were routed so badly is that um the forages that the horses, uh, the, you know, cavalry horses were consuming uh, could have been toxic. Now, the reason we think this is that um, based upon letters back from the, you know, from the battlefronts and the Indian Wars and so on, uh, there were descriptions of the of what was happening to their horses. They were losing their tail hairs. They were becoming very much uh, laminitic and, and actually in some cases sloughing their hooves. And so uh it, it's kind of funny uh with the equine science society there was a guy uh named uh, dr harold hints who would do a presentation about this very thing and and the title of his story was general custer died from selenium toxicity okay so that, that's i mean it's ridiculous right we all know from history that you know he and and his his troops died from bullets and arrows not selenium toxicity but here's the leap of logic um because of the, the those those uh, communications uh, that were preserved forever uh the thought was that during a drought uh which was happening at the time uh the selenium accumulator plants where of course in the in the west the soil selenium is extremely high anyway um that um that because of the drought, the there was additional selenium accumulating uh, in in the plants, and then the horses were eating, you know, whatever you know green plants they could find, which were these selenium accumulator plants slash weeds, and uh, many of them then uh, had uh, selenium toxicity, and and just just geographically. Uh, and many people know this already probably, but uh, east of the Mississippi, uh, soil selenium levels are, are low. West of the Mississippi, uh, soil selenium is high. And then during certain, you know, climatic conditions, then, um, you know, you're going to you're going to have problems with super high selenium in, in the plants. And so so that that just goes to show that, you know, in many cases, uh, you know, toxicity may be seasonal. It may be related to weather. There's a lot of a uh, lot of different variables um, that um, are going to affect how toxic a plant may be for horses. So, of course, I start with the first slide here, which is a, a, a horse eating a toxic plant. This one happens to be a milkweed. And, uh, you know, eating that one plant, probably not going to kill the horse, might show some signs of toxicity, might not be in the greatest health. But but um, anyway, uh, one common thing that we find is that many of these weeds are found in fence lines because, you um, 
you know, this is uh, where, especially on, you know, things like cherry trees and stuff and, um, you know, birds will eat cherries and then they'll land on a fence and defecate. And there you go. Now you've got a seed planted at the base of the fence, which then grows up and, and uh, can be a problem with, with toxicity. So anyway, so some general ideas to start with as we, as we start out this, this slide set. All right, so so why do horses uh, sometimes uh, consume toxic plants? Well, um, some of them, not very many, uh, are palatable. Some some horses actually like the taste of some of these toxic weeds. One of the common ones that kind of fall into this category is white snake root. You hear periodically horses uh, being uh, poisoned by white snake root, and they have to eat quite a bit of it uh, to to become. Uh, poisoned or show toxicity symptoms, um, uh, but but to, to to a lot of horses, white snake root is pretty palatable. They think it tastes pretty good, uh, but and that's not the case for most toxic plants. Thank goodness, you know most most horses will avoid uh, most toxic plants uh, because they really don't taste very good and are are non palatable. Um, but you know, oftentimes. Uh, Horses like to uh, graze on tender young shoots of whatever is green and coming up out of the ground, uh, when, especially when there's nothing else available. Um, sometimes uh, toxic plants can get mixed with hay or other feed, and crop damage uh, by frost uh, can also cause plants to become toxic when they aren't necessarily toxic to begin with. Let's see here. Come on now. Uh oh, there we go. All right, so what are some of the modes of action um, and some of the symptoms? You know, it's really highly variable. Um, this particular slide set kind of uh, categorizes uh, plants the way that a toxicologist would in terms of, you know, different modes of action. Um, there are certain plants that cause sudden death. Uh, certain plants that affect the cardiovascular system or the digestive system or skin and liver. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, the liver uh, affect, affect, uh, affects the skin in terms of it becoming um, uh, photosensitive. I'll talk about some of those later. Uh, plants may affect the blood, uh, the nervous system, may cause kidney failure. Uh, some are associated with congenital defects and reproductive failure. Um, Plants can affect the musculoskeletal system, the mammary glands, just all kinds of places where the um, uh, toxic plants can, can be active. Okay, so the, here's sort of a general category uh, from a um, toxicology uh, the study, which I copied very liberally from. Um, uh, so the cyogen, uh, cy cyanogenic glycosides, and so, of course cyanogenic is the key word here, which means cyanide poisoning, also known as prussic acid, which is the, you know, the uh, cyanide with a hydrogen stuck to it. Um, and what happens in many cases is that the uh, plant enzymes are released when plant cells are damaged by crushing, chewing, or they become drouthy, wilted or frozen, and then they hydrolyze the glycosides to gl cyanide. And of course, that's the, that's the very toxic form. Um, so um, cy glycosides are normally isolated in cell vacuoles, come into contact with the cell enzymes, and then hydrocyanic acid or prussic acid cyanide is formed. Um, you've probably seen, you know, just you know movies that that uh, show you know people being poisoned and and they start gasping and you know grabbing their throat and stuff like this and that's basically the effect of these uh, cyanogenic glycosides it, it prevents the release of oxygen to tissues and so basically the the horse that consumes them is being asphyxiated so they're going to have labored breathing frothing at the mouth dilated pupils convulsions uh, sometimes bright red mucous membranes and some of the plants that uh, have these compounds include cherry, uh, blue, fla blue flax, elderberry, Johnson grass, and apple. So, um, so uh, they are found both in the seeds and leaves, uh, most toxic when the leaves are young or wilted. And here's some pictures. Of, so here's, a, here's some wild cherry trees. 
And in many cases, people don't realize that their their fence lines are just full of cherry because they keep trying to you know ch chop down the whatever plants are there. Um, but the the cherries just keep sprouting back up from the roots, and so they may not really look like a tree per se. They may just look like a little you know weedy patch or whatever. But in fact, it is it is cherry. And then of course, as I mentioned earlier, the way that the cherry gets there is birds just love these little wild cherries they eat them and you know digest most of the the fruit material off and then the the the, the pit or the seed is in the middle that gets defecated into the fence line and up pops a cherry tree or a cherry shrub or whatever okay so uh symptoms of cherry poisoning slobbering increased respiration weak pulse convulsions uh, red membranes, rapid, and it can be rapid death, actually. And then apples to a less extent. I mean, we all know horses like apples. There are some glycosides found in the seeds, uh, can be toxic to the horses if the, if it's eaten in large quantities. Um, and um, of course, horses have been known to develop colic from gorging on fallen apples, um, probably not just from the seeds, but also from the, you know, high levels of sugars and so on. Okay, um, hydrangeas and, and a lot of these ornamental plants. I mean, uh, unless proven otherwise, you know, most ornamental plants tend to be toxic. So, so hydrangea is a, a good example, which uh, d does contain cyanide compounds like the cherry leaves. Um, those are found in all parts of the hydrangea. Also, uh, uh, cyanide toxicity can be uh, in. Um, Sorghum, sorghum sedan grass, Johnson grass. Johnson grass is actually, as, as far as I know, I remember when I was back taking um, some of the crop science classes, it was considered a, a noxious weed. I think it still is. Uh, but but the uh, sedan grass is, is pretty closely related and can also have uh, some uh, cyanide toxicity associated with it, especially when the plants are stressed, such as drought and frost. Okay, so here's some of the symptoms, you know, staggering, cystitis, of course, which is, uh, you know, inflammation of the uh, urinary tract, uh, weight loss, um, uh, you know, hind end, you know, degeneration, staggering, um, oftentimes uh, foals born uh, to mares grazed on sorghum pasture in early pregnancy might have some, uh, some, some of these same issues. Okay. Um, Cardiac glycosides, another general category uh, found in some of your to toxicology texts and so on. Uh, these can be found in all uh, plant parts of, of plants that are affected with these compounds. Um, not too much really needs to be ingested to produce poisoning. Drought and freezing temperatures, and this is kind of a common thread. Any, a lot of plants become more toxic during drought, freezing temperatures, wilting, and all those things. And, and Consequently, uh, and coincidentally, I should say, horses uh, tend to eat whatever's green when you know drought and freezing temperatures cause the the um, you know crop plants to uh, to stop growing. So they uh, these cardiac glycosides then inhibit cellular membrane sodium potassium pump. And anybody, uh, I'll just stop here for a second and ask this question: Has anybody ever had a quarter horse? that is affected by HYPP, anybody? Yes or no, no? Can you still hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Kevin. Every once okay. in a while, you um, kind of out a little bit, but yep. Oh, I cut out here with you. Okay, very good. Um, so anyway, what I was going to say is that um, uh, you know, kind of similar to HYPP, which is the hyperkalemic periodic paralysis in uh, genetically affected quarter every, horses. Every once in a while, you do cut out, but then you come back. Well, that's not very good, is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what I was going to say is that, um, you know, sometimes the, um, the um, membrane pump for sodium and potassium 
uh, is affected when uh, horses have HYPP. Then you get the, you know, some of these compounds also on board and you could have some really severe effects because uh, just the genetic effect that causes um, HYPP in quarter horses is also a similar mode of action to this particular class of, of toxin in plants. Okay, so if, you're, if you can still hear me, let me see now. Did that go from minimized to full screen just then? Yes, it did. Okay, very good. All right, thank you. And can you see me? I don't have my uh, my screen set up to where I can see myself. And get you really tiny on the top by saying, view who's talking. <laughs> okay, very good, very good. All right. So anyway, uh, some of the uh, effects of these particular toxins include, you know, hemor hemorrhagic enteritis, which just means you know, bloody lining of the GI tract, uh, abdominal pain, diarrhea, irregular heart activity. So, and, and then some of the, uh, uh, some of the weeds that are affected, uh, that have this particular type of compound, milkweed, foxglove, oleander, dogbane, lily of the valley, hyacinth. So all kinds of, uh, especially, uh, ornamentals, um, high in this particular type of toxin. Uh, milkweed, of course, my very, very first slide showed a, a young horse eating milkweed over the top of a fence. Uh, this uh, particular plant is most toxic during rapid growth, uh, can retain toxicity even when dried. Uh, the narrower leaf varieties tend to be more toxic than the broad leaf varieties. So there are several different types of milkweed. My mom actually raises <laughs> milkweeds on purpose so that uh, so that the monarchs will will nest uh, and uh, you know eat the milkweed and so she has like a monarch garden with lots and lots of milkweed. Okay, uh, it doesn't take much milkweed to uh, cause fatal poisoning of an adult adult horse and you know there's no need for me to go over the, all of the symptoms and all of these every time but you can see some of these symptoms here from uh, from milkweed toxicity. Okay, dogbane, also another one, uh, similar to milkweed, doesn't take very much uh, to, uh, to cause toxicity symptoms um, and can, can kill horses. So, you know, here's the symptoms. And of course, the last one, which is the one you want to avoid, is death. Okay, foxglove, same thing, another ornamental. Um, just takes a few hundredths of a percent of the animal's body weight to be fatal. So all of these, so... You know, many, many ornamental plants are very, very toxic to horses. Okay, oleander, a lot of people just love them. They're beautiful plants. Um, about an ounce of oleander can kill a large horse. So it doesn't take much. All right, black locust, um, also glycosides, and uh, another type of toxin uh, in the lectin category. Um, Toxicity found in all parts of the tree, including the bark. So these are the symptoms for a black locust toxicity in a horse. And horse chestnut, okay. Um, and I remember as a kid, my brothers and my sister and I would go out and find these. We called them buckeyes, which, you know, they're very similar to a buckeye and actually in the same, you know, genetic category of plant. And, uh, uh, anyway, the, and those nuts are quite uh, toxic, not that most horses would eat them, but uh, uh, if for any reason the horse starts eating horse chestnut, either the, either the chestnuts themselves or the leaves or the, or the bark or anything like that, only about 1% of the body weight of the horse ingested can cause poisoning. Okay, um, again, here's some symptoms, and this is what the the tree looks like from a distance, kind of pretty leaves, kind of the very, I think it's called variegated, right? I'm not very, very good on the plant terminology, but, uh, you know, kind of an attractive tree with these big pods that hold the, the quote, buckeyes. Okay, uh, alkaloids. Now, this is one, and I put this one right up on the top. I got a, a good story to go along with this one here. Uh, Japanese yew. One of the most popular ornamental bushes that you can find anywhere. Lots of people have at least one of these on their property somewhere. 
um, many years ago on a trip out to uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And we uh, always took a little side trip down through Kentucky. And then we, we'd end up going up the Shenandoah Valley and, and uh, stop at some horse farms to, to work out with the judging team and all this. But uh, the, the, the first uh, little swing we did was uh, we would, we would uh, practice judging in, in Kentucky and we'd stop by the Kentucky, well, not the Kentucky Derby per se, but uh, um, what's the uh, Churchill Downs. We'd stop at Churchill Downs. So, so anyway, I was standing there uh, looking at the horses come on the track, parading and uh, standing right near the winner's circle. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. I looked at the whole winter circle, which was entirely enclosed by Japanese yew, which is one, one of the most toxic plants you can put in front of a horse. Now, our horse is going to be standing there in the winter circle worrying about eating anything. Probably not, but it wouldn't take too much for that horse to walk into the winter circle, reach over, grab a mouthful, and, and probably wouldn't be enough to kill the horse, but it could make it pretty sick. And, you know, one of the major bastions of horse racing in the United States, Churchill Downs, here you go, surrounding the winter circle with a very, very toxic plant, which I thought was pretty ironic. <laughs> so I was standing there next to Deb Hagstrom and I said, hey, look at that. And she goes, what? And I just pointed out the plant. She goes, what? And I said, there's Japanese yew surrounding the winter circle. She goes, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. So anyway, there's... Uh, this category of, of uh, toxin is found in a number of plants which are listed here, and Japanese yew is possibly the worst. So here uh, the particular alkaloid in uh, yew is called taxine, and um, mode of action inhibits normal sodium and calcium exchange across myocardial cells, which causes arrhythmias. Um, also similar to sort of the genetic uh, results of HYPP in quarter horses. So if you if you guys are, are, are horse riders and not just uh, quarter horse um, halter exhibitors, you probably aren't familiar with HYPP or haven't experienced it, which is good. But anyway, these uh, these plants can sort of mimic some of the um, some of the uh, negative uh, features of, of HYPP, which is a genetic disease. So it doesn't take much, eight to 16 ounces of yew leaves uh, to be uh, fatal to a horse. Okay, so again, here's some of the symptoms. And of course, the bottom line symptom is death. All right, <clears throat> hemlock. Um, poisoning can develop within an hour of hemlock consumption, so a very fast-acting act, fast toxin. Um, so here's some of the symptoms. Again, I don't need to go through all of them. Uh, water hemlock, um, chicotoxin is the toxin involved here. Uh, one of the most toxic natural occurring plants. Um, roots are highly poisonous all the time. Um, so a lethal dose, let's see, what does it say here? So I think about, it's kind of cut off on my, I think it's about eight ounces is all that it takes of uh, water hemlock to potentially be lethal. <clears throat> Okay, here's some of the symptoms involved with uh, poisoning by water hemlock. Okay, red maple. Now, this is one that a lot of people have experience with because this is also a very popular ornamental tree. People love the fall color where the trees become bright red. And um, unfortunately, it doesn't take a lot of uh, red maple leaves uh, from a tree that's not even in the paddock but may be close by. Those leaves can you know, blow uh, into the paddock where the horses are located. And so um, red maple and closely related hybrids have this toxicity. So you want to avoid red maples uh, at all cost. Okay, so it doesn't, again, doesn't take too many leaves uh, to kill a horse. And so you want uh, red maples, if you, if you inherit a property that has uh, red maple or buy a property that has red maple and you expect to house horses nearby, you probably better cut them down. It's too bad. It's a beautiful tree, but but it is uh, it is toxic to horses. Okay, here's one of those that I mentioned was uh, fairly palatable to horses. And this is a fairly common problem that uh, 
you know, vet clinics will see horses coming in with white snake root toxicity. Um, it can also, especially if you're a breeder, uh, this, the white snake root toxicity can be transferred to foals by the mother's milk. Um, it's readily eaten and it's one of those uh, weeds that is fairly palatable to horses. So it's very dangerous for that reason. It takes a lot really of it, of, you know, one to 10% of a horse's body weight. So, you know, for a thousand pound horse, it's gonna take one to 10 pounds, um, you know, to, uh, to uh, cause toxicity. However, it is it is fairly palatable horses, so it happens quite a bit. So uh, of the green plant, um, it talks about uh, the fact that only about a half uh, to 1.5% can be uh, poisonous, toxic. All right, so uh, trembles is, uh, is, is sort of a general terminology for any neurological shaking, uh, you know, disorder. But uh, it, it's pretty, you know, back, back when I was learning about some of these plants in my plant sciences class, the trembles, the, in quote, was, was the term that was pretty much exclusively uh, related to consumption of white snake root and then the resulting toxicity symptoms. Okay, then some other categories of toxins uh, include uh, nightshade, um, causes extreme irritation on the digestive tract, uh, colic, constipation, hemorrhagic diarrhea, in other words, bloody stool. And um, so this is, uh, this is one that results in accumulation of high levels of acetylcholine, which inhibits then parasympathetic nervous system causing, you know, very dry mouth, um, lack of uh, intestinal uh, motility, dilated pupils, fast heart rate, all that. Okay, also nightshade such as uh, Jimson weed, horse nettle, uh, black nightshade. Uh, the black nightshade has the highest concentration of toxins um, in unripe berries. A symptoms of the of nightshade consumption so it's kind of of the digestive category causing extreme irritation of the GI tract okay oaks can be toxic as well whether that's whether it's leaves branches um, acorns okay the acorns are probably the most toxic so many types of oaks tend to be quite toxic to horses. All right. So lack of eating, depression, excessive thirst, frequent urination, all those kind of things with oak toxicity. Okay, black walnut. This is one that a lot of people have heard of and not necessarily because um, black walnuts that common out in horse pastures and stuff like that, but um, when black walnut is inadvertently included in bedding, such as shavings, as little as 20% of the black walnut shavings uh, in a, you know, in, in, in wood shaving bedding can cause horses to colic founder, especially founder laminitis is the, is the most serious symptom and um, can cause both laminitis, colic, and, um, respiratory distress as well. So they have a, they have not only problems breathing, but their belly hurts, their, their feet start to slough off. And so it's, it's really pretty serious when you uh, accidentally include black walnut shavings. And what, wh when this happens, you know, it's not uncommon. I, uh, it used to be, I would, uh, back when I was poor, I had a horse out at the Champaign County fairgrounds and, um, course I knew about the the black walnut problem and uh, I would pick up some some shavings when I knew that they were pure white and uh, came from pine and stuff like that but there were a couple times I'd go to a and this was uh, I should I should elaborate uh, I would go to a uh, uh, furniture manufacturer and they would have these big piles of uh, these big piles of uh, sawdust which they would just let people pick up if they wanted to and uh, so I, I did that a few times, but then there were a couple of uh, cases where some of the shavings were really dark and I asked some questions and I said, you know, have you been, you know, putting together, constructing um, uh, like, you know, tables and 
you know, whatever from black walnut. And they said, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we have. And I was like, okay, I don't want any of that. So, uh, so anyway, um, if it's, if it's accidentally included in the bedding, it can be a real serious problem. <clears throat> All right. Other bushes, shrubs, and vines, uh, you know, rhododendrons are a real problem and some of the related plants as well. So showing you some of those that are commonly accidentally consumed by horses or can be. Okay, there's a toxin called cryanotoxin, which is also known as rhodotoxin, which is easier to remember since it's in a rhododendron. But um, uh, horses tend to be most often poisoned during the winter. Uh, rhododendrons, uh, even after they're you know frosted and and wilted, they still look pretty green and appealing, and it doesn't take much, about 0.2% of the body weight of leaves to develop signs of poisoning. And the symptoms are here. Also burning bush. I mean, I, I, I'm not going to spend lots of time on all these because there are so, so many. Um, perennial sweet peas, uh, toxin called lathrogen. Um, both wild and, and cultivated forms of sweet peas are, are toxic. Uh, Produce similar symptoms as sedan grass or Johnson grass. Uh, muscle stiffness similar to tying up can, can occur. Um, plants that can cause sudden death. Um, the sweet pea I mentioned in the toxin is called osteolathrosum. Um, I know you won't remember any of these. That's fine because you can always look them up if you have any kind of question with, uh, with toxic plants that will be out there online for sure. Um, Again, um, if you're a breeder and uh, you have pregnant mares, um, eating uh, Sudan grass or sorghum hybrids can result in foal death, um, all that kind of stuff, which is to be avoided. Uh, privet, another toxic plant, toxic from both the berries and leaves. Horses generally won't eat it in the Unless nothing else is, that's that's green or lush or tender is available, um, but horses will oftentimes eat a lot of things if that's all there is. They have a very strong drive to chew things and and eat plants, and so if there are no pasture grasses, no crops that are harmless, they will eat things that are harmful. Okay, bracken fern. Here's one that uh, periodically can be a real problem because um, uh, horses that have turnouts that include areas of wooded, um, you know, wooded trails or whatnot, um, they will oftentimes encounter bracken fern. And, and it has an interesting mode of action. It contains an, enz an enzyme that splits vitamin B1, which is thiamine, into two inactive compounds. So basically what it results in is um, acute vitamin deficiency. So, um, you know, a horse that's that's consuming plenty of B vitamins, which is is rich in any kind of a green pasture plant, um, uh, it, it basically inactivates uh, that uh, that B vitamin, uh, so that uh, it, the the horse suddenly becomes B vitamin deficient, and um, it still it takes quite a bit of uh, consumption. Of bracken fern to uh, to show clinical symptoms. However, it's another one of those plants that uh, the horse may develop a taste for, and so therefore it may have a problem with it. Okay, symptoms: refusal to eat, weight loss, depression, muscle tremors, rapid heart rate, um, paralysis, staggering—you know, all that kind of stuff. Horsetail usually not very palatable at all, but very similar effect to bracken fern. Thiamine enzyme causes uh, the toxin, which then binds up, uh, doesn't allow uh, B1 to be available in the horse's system. So if you've ever been hiking or whatever, you go through a lot of times along river bottoms and stuff, you'll find a lot of this horsetail and it's really, really tough. It's you know, it's surprising that horses would would eat enough of it uh, to cause toxicity, but sometimes they do, especially young horses that are unfamiliar with uh, with plants. Okay, many many weeds and wildflowers which are toxic, so I'm sh surely not going to go over all those. Uh, 
Something as common as the common cockleburr is pretty toxic to horses. If they uh, eat even uh, you know under 1% of body weight, up to 3% of body weight of the young, rapidly growing plants can be toxic, uh, can potentially cause sudden death, convulsions, blindness, uh, recumbency, which just means laying down. Okay, photosensitivity. This is one that's kind of interesting because there are uh, there are plants which uh, cause what's called primary photosensitivity. In other words, the plants contain already compounds that are readily absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract to the blood. And then as the blood um, passes through non-pigmented skin, um, it causes um, blistering and, and irritation um, that uh, can actually kill skin cells and then it results in sloughing of dead skin cells. And there's, there's not too many that actually are, uh, that actually cause what's called primary photosensitivity. Most uh, plants that cause photosensitivity actually um, are uh, secondary, which, which is secondary to liver damage. I'll talk about that next. So St. John's wort is one that has uh, primary photosensitivity and then directly has a compound that irritates the skin when it's exposed to light. Okay, so secondary photosensitivity is, is more common uh, and the underlying cause is liver disease. And then once liver damage is advanced, uh, the horse is unable to eliminate a byproduct of chlorophyll degradation. Then this byproduct accumulates in the blood and causes damage to blood vessels and tissues of the skin as it exposed to UV light. So the UV light, uh, just, you know, daylight, um, uh, causes the, um, the compounds to uh, become, you know, more severe and then it causes lots of blistering and light colored skin. So uh, plants like rattlebox, groundsels, and tarweed uh, can cause secondary photosensitivity, uh, secondary to liver damage. Now, the one that's most interesting to me because I've had most experience with it is fungal secondary photosensitivity and things like which seem are seemingly, um, you know, non-threatening stuff like alcite clover, um, moldy, you know, alfalfa, uh, moldy corn poisoning. These all cause secondary uh, photosensitivity as a response to the fungi that live on the plant. So it's not compounds in the plant per se normally, but under certain circumstances, uh, fungus grows on these plants, which then can cause uh, photosensitivity, which we call secondary photosensitivity, just like those other plants. So what happens is you get, um, and so here's a picture of alcite clover. You know, most people would look out across a, a pasture of, of horses and say, oh yeah, what a nice uh, crop of clover. The horses love that. And they do, they like to eat it. But if it happens to have uh, contamination um, with, with, the, uh, um, with the fungus, uh, this is the result. So, uh, and I'm pretty sure this picture was taken uh, just outside of Champaign a few years ago. Um, there was a, a horse breeder named uh, Bonnie Stanton who had a, oh, she had a Zippo Pine Bar son that uh, uh, was, a, was a Pinto and, and um, he would have a lot of foals with, uh, with white on their face. And, and one time, just out of the clear blue, many, many of these horses that had a lot of white patches and or light gray skin coloration, anything that had light skin that didn't kind of block out the ultraviolet radiation came down with this real severe photosensitization, blistering and peeling of skin. And, um, and so what basically was happening was another common term is dew poisoning, where you, you did have this fungus associated with the clover. And then so uh, besides the, uh, the peeling skin, some of the horses were saying, most didn't, but some had a little bit of colic, a little depression, um, diarrhea. And so this actually then, um, the, uh, the fungus affects the liver, causes liver damage. And then some of the um, other compounds in the, in the fungus then can, um, upon exposure to sunlight, can cause this, this damage to the skin. Okay, again, here's another plant uh, that causes uh, secondary photosensitization. 
Okay, red clover is another one. Um, you know, oftentimes included in pasture mixes as uh, you know as 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 grazing. Um, however, uh, there are times when uh, there is a high level of slaframine, which is the toxin from the fungus Rhizoctonia leguminicola, <laughs> kind of a long name, causing black patch disease, and then that results in slobbers. And so, you know, it's uh, you know back in the day, I used to uh, hang out at my grandpa's place a lot. He had a bunch of horses on pasture and he had a lot of red clover in his pasture. And there would be times when the whole bunch of the, the mares out on pasture with red clover would have slobbers. And he said, oh yeah, that's no big deal. It'll, it'll pass. Well, it, there are some things happening besides just the slobbering. You know, the horses can have symptoms like stiffness, diarrhea, potentially blindness, abortion, founder. So slobbers isn't just totally, um, you know, totally a, a safe, you know, occasional symptom of, of red clover black patch. It can be fairly serious when it's, uh, when it's, uh, when the fungus is at high levels. Okay. Hairy vetch, um, crown vetch. This is oftentimes seen on, um, oh, hillsides to, to kind of stabilize, um, soil kind of makes a pretty ground cover, stuff like that. Pokeweed, certain grasses can be toxic. I think everybody knows about tall fescue, the old fashioned tall fescue, which has an endophyte associated with the seed head. And uh, that can certainly cause problems, especially if you're a breeder. It can cause, um, you know, lack of milk production in the mares. Um, can cause thickened placentas, which then the foal can't uh, can't escape, and you have a red bag delivery and resulting death of the foal. So there are several things that can happen with uh, with certain grasses as well. So it's not just broad leaves, mostly, but uh, not just broad leaves. Okay, larkspur, buttercup, oakweed. <laughs> So, there's so many of these that I, I can't just, I don't need to spend a whole lot of time on these, but, but uh, you know, again, common theme, ornamentals many times are toxic. Okay. So let's just get down to the bottom line here and then we'll get to the questions and answers. So really uh, the, the, the recommendations I'm wanting to leave you with here are that you should assume that any unknown plant that isn't the pasture grass or legume may be toxic and in some cases in some <laughs> at some times maybe even those might be but not usually uh, don't let your horse graze in wooded or weedy areas on trail rides um, keep fence lines free of weedy overgrowth um, you know spray roundup along the fence lines and kill everything that way you don't have to worry about what's toxic and what's not uh, renovate weedy or overgrazed pastures. Um, so, you know, periodically if, if they've just been overgrazed and you've got bare patches and weeds, you know, just plow it in and, and, and start over and reseed with, with a good pasture mix. Um, use rotational grazing to maximize forage use and reduce weed growth. And so those are, uh, five recommendations that, uh, hopefully most of you can, can understand and follow. Okay, so that's all I have for a organized presentation. Do we have any questions or, or comments? Is there any way to determine what they ate based on the systems or blood tests, or is it just kind of a swag? Yeah, it's it's going to be mostly a swag. I mean, that's that's going to be a call that your vet's going to have to make. And um, so, you know, do a do a walk through on your pasture, your fence line, stuff like that, wherever the horse may have been exposed, and uh, kind of narrow down the possible suspects, so to speak. Um, but but yeah, I mean, you know, ba based upon the symptoms, oftentimes you're going to narrow it down to to a certain number of plants just based upon the symptoms. Some of these seem to mimic or show same similar signs to the EPM, which seems to be pretty prevalent out in our parts here too. Do the positive. Uh, absolutely. 
So it's still kind of a guess, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you know, just, you know, you can't always assume that it's due to toxicity from plants for sure. I mean, yeah, it might be. And like I said, you know, you can see horses that are, um, you know, that are staggering or, you know, neurological in certain ways just from either genetics or, um, you know, potential infect, infect, infectious processes. So, yeah, there, there are a lot of things to, uh, to narrow down. Any other questions or comments? You guys have been yeah, sitting no, here all day already, yeah, haven't you? Yeah. Okay, that was kind of garbled. I'm sorry. Hi, Kevin. I think there was a chat. I think there was a we chat that a came into in yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, where do I find uh, this? Is my first time on this particular program. I usually do Zoom, so where is the chat? I've, I've got it here, Kevin. The question is, when mentioning quantities of ingested material, is there a formula for what exactly qualifies as large quantity? Is there a uh, way to tell how much our horse may have ingested? Yeah, based on research, I mean, I tried to give some, um, you know, examples in terms of percentage of body weight uh, consumed, although it's, you know, that would, would pro, you know, it depends on the time period of ingestion as well. But, um, you know, in, in some of those that cause sudden death, for instance, it doesn't take very much and it doesn't take a very long period of time, you know, so, um, but if you look back at some of those slides, it does, it, I tried and the best information I could find. And again, I'm not a, I'm not a toxicologist, but I did have several um, sort of doses listed in some cases, but not all. So you could look at those again and see, but um, uh, a, a large amount, I would say, okay, just in general, if it's over one to say 3% of a horse's body weight. So you're talking about, you know, you know, 10 to say 30 pounds of, of material. And most horses aren't going to consume that much, probably. Uh, although that some of the exceptions would be things like white snake root that, that are pretty palatable for the horse. So, you know, the fact that, uh, that the horse might gorge on 10 to 30 pounds of, of white snake root makes it, makes it dangerous, even though it's not you know, as toxic as a lot of these other things, for instance, like, uh, like Japanese U only takes just a, a few ounces of that, uh, to cause the horse to, to become extremely ill. Um, you know, it's, uh, so, so, so I would say to address that question, what I would consider large amounts would be one to 3% of the horse's body weight, which is 10 to 30 pounds to cause toxicity. And then others might just be a matter of ounces. Thank you, Dr. Klein. Um, we have okay. our slide up with his contact information, and we will include that in our Facebook event page in the discussion if anyone has any further questions to email him do we have any further questions in the chat i don't see any but this is an opportunity to ask those questions um, are there any resources uh, perhaps a book that might be available it's it's great to take pictures and then come in and try to you know look up what we're looking for, but to just kind of look at a plant um, or is there an app? I know there's a couple apps that will let you take a picture and then they kind of do the searching for you. Do you have any recommendations for something like that? Boy, that's. Uh... 
something I may should I maybe should have anticipated something like that, but I don't know. I mean, I know that, for instance, the U of I uh, vet school has a toxic plant garden and they've got some uh, toxicologists that are very well versed in that. So I would suggest calling the U of I vet clinic if you have any any particular questions about toxicity of plants. They should be able to uh, should be able to answer that question. Um, that's kind of out of my area of expertise. Okay. And I believe actually, um, if I'm not mistaken, the ASPCA's uh, poison hotline is based near you guys. Is that correct? Down in Urbana? Yeah. I mean, we have a, yeah, we have a toxicology hotline. Um, so, so certainly call them. And uh, so, yeah, that's kind of what I meant was uh, there is a toxicology hotline that, that you can call and, and there will be experts in toxicology to talk to you. Wonderful. And we'll find that resource and put it in the discussion on our Facebook page as well. Um, Dr. McCombs actually had to leave a little bit early. She had being a vet, had uh, a client that was having an emergency that she needed to get to. So we didn't imagine have that to ask her this question. But um, Dr. Klein, we have, you know, <laughs> as, as every good podcast or um, book series has, we have kind of a, a fun question that we've been asking everyone. What was your favorite horse book when you were a kid? <laughs> my, my favorite horse book, huh? Oh, man. Um, I think, uh, okay, <laughs> when, I was, when I was really little, it was Jim Jump. I loved Jim Jump. <laughs> okay, I mean it's a children's book, right? So uh, I just I probably had okay. my mother read that. I probably had my mother read that to me a hundred times. Um, after that, I guess I would say Black Beauty is probably the other one. So did that get a few votes? Wonderful. <laughs> I'll bet you didn't get yeah, that we're one. Just, I, you know, I'm kind uh, of asking all of our presenters. Um, I thought it'd be fun to come up with. I'll bet you never got Jim Jump it would Jump be fun before. to come up with a reason. I have not. <laughs> so, um, but we're just coming up with a fun list for um, kids, and we figure ask our experts what they enjoyed the most. Yeah. So... Well, thank you so much, Dr. Klein. We really appreciate you being here and providing all of this information. Uh, and we will share your contact information on our group in case anyone has further questions. We are, oh, I apologize. Debbie did have a question here. Um, are there toxins that accumulate in the system? For example, if a horse is showing mild symptoms, if they're removed from the environment or the source of the plant, will they be able to recover? You know, once will it once work again, its way out of the system? Once once again, um, I'm sort of out of my element. Although I would I would say that there are certain heavy metals if you get into environmental contamination. Um, you know, and it's it's not unheard of that, uh, you know, horse owners will, you know, buy a property that's maybe, you know, buy an old smelter or something like that where you've got heavy metals, you know, lead and cadmium and certain things like that, which uh, can accumulate and be, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, in the skeletal system and so on permanently. Um, so, so there are some, but I would say probably rare. But again, I'm a little bit out of my element uh, with a question like that. You need to talk to somebody that's better trained in toxicology than I am. Well, we can, we can definitely do that. And we appreciate you sharing the wonderful information that you had. Holy cow. That was like a... <laughs> And, and, yeah, feel, feel free to feel free to send that to, to anybody you know extension materials can can be distributed uh, far and wide as much as as much as you want and again it's just 
it's just a, a certainly a partial list and just uh you know of course I, I think it's effective to at least uh, understand that there are so many toxic plants out there it's almost daunting to think that uh you know unless unless it's just a very few pasture plants and so on that that pretty much anything and everything else can potentially be toxic because we didn't have enough to worry about <laughs> right <laughs> wonderful thank you so much for your time today we appreciate it and we it's it's actually sunny up here in woodstock Yay. so we hope that it's sunny down in central illinois as well yeah well i'm looking out the window and it's not so sunny but uh, hopefully later on the clouds will start to break up absolutely we have on the screen right now next month's topic will be mythbusters equine edition um, Dr. King is a colleague of both Dr. Klein's and mine from Horseman's Council of Illinois, and she was the founder and director of the equine, pro, equine department at Southern Illinois University Carbondale. So all those questions that, as people have mentioned this morning, you get different opinions depending on who you're asking. Dr. King will be with us on May 21st to help us figure out how to determine the validity of what we're hearing and the best source for facts and correct information. So we will have the link up later today to start registering for that. As always, please feel free to share our Facebook event or our email newsletter that has our information with friends, family, colleagues, your barn buddies, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you again, Dr. Klein. Thank you for organizing it, Jen. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Have a great rest of your weekend.